materialist, if I'm having a conversation with a materialist, if they make an argument for materialism, what are they going to use in order to make that argument? Mm. Right? There'll, there'll be one conscious mind having a conversation with another conscious mind, using reason and rhetoric and emotion and appealing to laws of logic. And what do you notice about all these things? Like, they're completely immaterial. Completely immaterial. <laughs> I mean, there are an awful lot of things that you can point to in society at present uh, that have a God-shaped hull. Reality is always pushing back at us and saying, there is more, what is this pointing to? Science involves belief every bit as much as Christianity. The power of Christianity is expressed most potently through its stories. Those who are, who are prophesying the global decline of religion, th those prophecies have failed, big time. So on this episode, we're thinking about science, rationality, and consciousness. Um, and surely this is the, the real defeat for Christianity, because I'm always hearing people say, well, science and faith, their enemies. Um, have you come across that kind of objection before? Have I? Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> this is like, like the whole time, it, like I go around university campuses to kind of talk about Christianity to, to people who are not Christians. And it's, if you don't address the question early on in the week, like it just gets asked in the question and answer happen. time anyway. Yeah. And so it, it, it kind of, it kind of tires me out because I, I like, f like for me, I don't see the conflicts, no. you know, anymore. I don't see the conflict anymore. And, and I think there are ways of transcending this narrative of a punch up between science and faith, but it comes like all the time, all the time. So why is it such a big objection? Like one answer, I think Tom Holland's answer. So, the, you know, the, the historian that we've uh, been quoting quite a bit on, on reset and we uh, interviewed him at one stage. Um, I think his answer would be, it's because we're so gosh darn Christian. Mm. Um, and in particular, we, we are out of this um, tradition that, okay, the first eruption of Christianity was the first century, and then there were further eruptions in the 11th century. And then the Reformation in the 16th century was another kind of eruption. But the Enlightenment and the scientific method was another eruption. And what these eruptions were was basically the Logos, the Word, Jesus, um, kind of dispels the darkness. So in the incarnation, Christmas, you know, the first century is the Logos, the Word, Christ dispelling the darkness. Um, and, and then you get, you know, all throughout, um, you know, the 11th century and, and, and these kind of the, 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 the revolution that's happening, the Reformatio, the Reformation that's happening um, uh, in, in medieval Christendom. And then you've got, you know, the Reformation under Luther, where it very much is the banishment of, of superstition and lies, you know, by the light of truth. Mm. Uh, and, and then you get, you know, kind of the Enlightenment is a further ripple of Reformation that's happening, where just as Luther wanted to strip back um, what's true from what is, you know, the accretions of, you know, popery and mariolatry and, you know, the, the hocus pocus of the mass and all that kind of stuff. He was stripping things back to the logos, to the word, right? And so you keep, you keep that spirit of reformation going and the enlightenment is, yeah, well, well why don't we just get rid of like God mm. and the angels and strip everything right back. And you kind of get the scientific method out of that where you've got the word, the logos, that dispels the darkness. And you might have a theory about stuff. I don't care what your theory is. Let's test it. Let's put it under laboratory <laughs> conditions. Let's do some empirical analysis of this. Um, and that, that actually, so that actually the scientific method is an incredibly Christian thing to do. Um, and, and therefore the idea that science is at the vanguard of an ongoing revolution and that religion is like in the rear view mirror. Yeah. That's a really Christian thing. Sure. <laughs> right. <laughs> so when when people come to you and they say, look, we don't really need religion and all that kind of stuff because we've got science now. How do you tend to respond to that? I think sometimes stories are the, are the best ways of like answering objections because they, they kind of they, they put you into a different thought world and they reorient you 
in, in a different kind of a way. So I tell the story of Betty the botanist, and, and uh, Betty's obviously been up all night in her lab, and Gareth, the lab assistant, comes in the next morning, and he says, Betty, have you been here all night? She said, yes, I'm just so glad that you gave me that botanical specimen yesterday. I've been running all sorts of spectral analyses. I've discovered whole ecosystems living on the, on the leaf of this biological specimen. I've mapped its genome. It's a first for this species. You know, I'm, I'm going to get my peer-reviewed you know, paper uh, in, in Nature magazine. Thank you so much for the botanical specimen. And, and Gareth says, botanical specimen? It was a long stem rose, Betty. It was Valentine's Day. Do you understand what I've given you? And you know, on, on one level, does Betty understand the rose? Yeah. She understands the rose like better than anyone else. On another level, does she understand the rose? No, she's an idiot, like a total <laughs> idiot. And she's not, un she's not getting the meaning of the rose because what if the rose is a love gift? Mm. Well, you don't put it under a microscope to discover, like, where is the love? Like, if, if this is meant to be a romantic gesture, Gareth, like, I didn't, I didn't read that in the genome. Yeah. Well, you're not going to, Betty, you moron. Like, <laughs> like get a grip, what, woman. What does Gareth see in it? <laughs> yeah, Seriously, like, it doesn't bode well. It, uh, yeah, yeah, he should move on. He should definitely move on. She's, she's happier in the lab anyway. <laughs> and then you just ask the question, what if the whole world is like that rose? Yeah. What if it's a love gift from somebody who's communicating to you? Yes, you can go into the laboratory and you can put things under the microscope and you can discover loads about this world. But the level at which this world is uh, a love gift, the level at which, at which the giver is communicating love to us is just not the scientific level. No. And, and you can have both, right? The, sure. The rose can both be a botanical specimen. It's not one or the other. And a romantic gesture. What if the world can be open to scientific analysis and theological analysis, mm. right? We, like, then we can be the best of friends, right? Yeah, absolutely. So they're not necessarily opposed. And actually, one of the people you spoke to was uh, Professor John Lennox, who I believe is Professor of Mathematics at is it Oxford? Yes. Oxford University. Um, he's one of the people you interviewed for the research series. Um, and he talks about this idea, doesn't he, of science and faith being opposed? He gets it all the time, too. So, yeah, <laughs> he's got a great answer. Let's have a look. What would you say, first of all, to, to somebody who uh, feels that science and faith are irreconcilable enemies? Well, I would say, first of all, that science depends crucially on faith. If you're using faith, and here comes the, the hook in this, science and faith are often opposed. But what do we mean by faith? If we mean religion, well, then we better say so, because if you mean faith in the subjective sense, that is my belief, then science is crucially dependent on that. And uh, for example, Einstein said famously that he could not imagine a scientist without that faith. Now he didn't mean faith in God. He meant faith in the fact, well, putting it simply that you can do science, putting it in a slightly more complex way, he meant faith in the rational intelligibility of the universe. So what did Einstein mean by the, the fact that you need to have faith in order to be able to do science? Well, he, he spoke of the rational intelligibility of the universe, which is the precondition for doing science. You, mm. need, you need to believe that this two pounds of grey matter like, has any purchase on the ultimate mysteries of the cosmos. Like, why should it? Mm. Especially if it's no, no more special than any other part of the cosmos. Um, and, and, and why should this brain have developed in, in order to, um, yeah, to be able to, to know the laws above and to know the world out there? And this is what um, I often talk about. You know, we, 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 we so often need to triangulate these three things. The scientific method de depends on laws up above, minds in here, and a world out there. And it depends on those three things triangulating. Um, because the scientific method is, okay, yeah, I got a theory about something, let's test it in, in the real world. And then I adjust my theory about how the laws operate up above by my mind engaging with the world. And, and like, it's astonishing that those three things should possibly triangulate. And so Einstein said, um, one of the great mysteries of the universe is that it is intelligible. You know, because, like, why should it be? Mm. Um, why, should it, why should it be a cosmos? Why is it not a chaos? Why does it, why does it operate according to these iron laws of, of uh, you know, uh, these regularities that are the same here and on the far side of Alpha Centauri? You know, what, why, why should the universe be like that? And why should my mind 
actually have a window onto that that kind of thing. So you know, if if, if you say that you know science is the eradication of miracles, it's not. Science depends on a miracle. Mm. Science de science depends on the fact that we are living in a miracle, and we are miracles, <laughs> like operating in miraculous ways in order to understand this universe. So science and faith, and I think even science and miracles are not opposed to one another because, because we're living in this miracle. So some people would say, well, Genesis is, if you believe the whole Genesis thing, well, that's completely anti-science anyway. Um, but what tools are there, do you think, in the Genesis story for us to help, uh, help us do science? Okay. All right, well, I'll, I'll do Genesis 1, you do Genesis 2, okay? okay? And then we'll think about Genesis 3. But Genesis 1... I mean, what do you have in Genesis 1? I mean, you have laws up above, minds in here, and a world out there. It's astonishing. You have, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it talks about these regularities. There was evening and there was morning. And there are the stars in their courses. And there, there are seeds that give rise to plants, that give rise to fruit, that gives rise to seeds. And you have these cycles of nature. You have these regularities. You have laws up above, right? Uh, as, as John chapter 1, reflecting back on Genesis 1 says, there is a logos, there is a word um, that by, by which the, the heavens kind of operate. But then, Genesis 1, 26, you get Adam and Eve, you know, humanity are made in God's image, in the image of God he created him. So why should we expect, you know, this gray matter to actually have any purchase on the mysteries of the cosmos? Well, what if my mind was specially made so that I could be in communion with the God of the cosmos? If that is the case, then, then I can start to trust my mind. Not trust it fully, because as we'll see in Genesis 3, there's been a fall, and so I might need to go out into the world and test things. I will need to go out into the world and test things. But what we have is laws up above, minds in here, and then in Genesis 1, humanity are told to have dominion over the world. Mm. We have a special place in the world. And every scientist knows that we have a special place in the world. Like if you're doing zoology, you know, you, you are studying the wildlife. The wildlife is not studying you, right? <laughs> you have this special place in which, yeah, th there is an order to things above and there is a world to explore below and you are in this really privileged position. You're like, in, you're like this mediator, mm. right? Yep. Well, Genesis 1 you know, puts humanity in that very position and, and gives you all the reason in the world to be a scientist, I think. Mm. And do we, is, we see something of that maybe in Genesis 2 with Adam's role um, as he, the animals are brought to him and he names the animals. So it's, he, he is the one who, who gives classification and categories to the animals. You know, and right. it's, it's, not, it's not the role of the animals to do that for themselves. Yeah. So he, he, he is there as the zoologist almost at that point. Yeah, doing yeah. That. Doing taxonomy, which, which as, as John Lennox says in, in that interview, he says it's kind of the foundation of every discipline. You can't really have a discipline unless you've got the names, you've got the categories for, for mm. things. So, yeah, first job, Adam, you know, you're going to be a scientist. You need to get your taxonomy straight. Does that. And then I think Genesis 3 is really interesting about the fall and the fallenness of our minds. Because I, I think, for instance, Greek thought... Um, was that rationality was unsullied. You know, your, your mind, your, your body might be experiencing the, the, um, the fall. It might be ex experiencing finitude and frailty and, and, and the fact that you're dying. Um, but your mind, ah, reason, it's, it's pure. And so, you know, for, for the Greek minds, they, they were brilliant at mathematics. Mm. They were quite good at astronomy. Um, but they didn't do experiments. Aristotle kind of said, you know, two objects, the, the heavier object falls faster than the, than the lighter object. We hear that and we in, we're instantly like, oh, so he did the experiment? No, he didn't do the experiment. He didn't think to do the experiment. If he'd done the experiment, he'd realize that objects fall at the same rate, no matter what weight they are. You know, he, he said that men have more teeth than women. You know, he, he said that bees have, have four legs, you know, which it's just, it's, I, always, I always make the joke because it, it, it just strikes me. Like, what is he doing? Does he have a bee crawling across his hands and he counts them, counts the legs going one, two, three, four, three, four, let's call it that, you know. <laughs> So if you're Aristotle, you think that, okay, your senses can lie to you and the world can lie to you and, and there are perception problems. Mm. What is most certain is that you descend into your rationality and that's, that's what will help you. But if you have a real vision of the fall, and actually the reformers in the Reformation, they were really um, bringing to the fore the fact of our fallenness. Um, that makes it ever more important 
that I do the experiment and that I peer review the results and that people check that I'm not cheating sure, yeah, and, and, yeah. and that kind of stuff. So all, all of that in Genesis 3 actually contributes to the scientific revolution as well. Mm. And so are there reasons within science that would make us doubt whether actually mechanistic science can help us to understand the reality as we experience it? Yeah, and, and I asked that question to uh, Rupert Sheldrake, I, I, a really interesting professor, mm. a, and um, I asked, you know, what is it within science that should make us think that science itself is not going to explain the totality of life? And this is what he said. So what I'm doing really is showing that science has grown out of the philosophy of materialism, which has been the kind of orthodoxy of science for over a hundred years now. Um, but most scientists and most people outside science don't realize that uh, these assumptions are essentially philosophical assumptions, not scientific assumptions, and that the evidence uh, has taken us beyond them. Mm. For example, the assumption that uh, nature is a machine is just a metaphor. It's not a proven fact. And the, uh, and the metaphor that nature is an organism, the Big Bang's like the hatching of the cosmic egg, the universe is like a growing organism, is actually a better metaphor for the universe than the machine. Um, the idea that nature is purposeless, uh, which is a st standard assumption, evolution has no purpose or meaning, follows from the idea that nature is a machine. Machines have no purposes of their own. The, the doctrine of the materialistic uh, worldview is that the universe is a machine. It's made up of unconscious matter. There's no consciousness beyond the universe. There's no consciousness within the universe because un matter is unconscious. Then, of course, there's the problem that we are conscious. Um, so some philosoph materialist philosophers try to pretend that we're not. They say that consciousness is an illusion or a meaningless epiphenomenon of the activity of our brains. But the trouble is to dismiss consciousness as an illusion uh, doesn't really explain it because illusion is itself a mode of consciousness. Mm. That's why the very existence of human consciousness is called the hard problem in philosophy of mind because in a materialist universe, it ought not to exist. So consciousness is just this massive area um, within philosophy of mind um, and within um, science where the, the mechanistic view just runs out, mm -hmm. really. And almost by intention. So um, both Rupert Sheldrake and John Lennox kind of mentioned uh, Thomas Nagel, who is a, uh, a philosopher who is atheistic, pretty much anti-theistic. Um, like he is very um, opposed to... Um, to, to faith and, and, and opposed, he doesn't want the universe to be like this. Yes, like, like yes. He, he's the guy who said, you that know, guy. yeah, we, we must sort of bolt the door against all religious explanations. Um, no, matter, no matter how ridiculous the mechanistic, materialistic explanations are, uh, we cannot allow a divine foot in the door because mm. he doesn't want the universe to be like that. Yeah. So this is, this, is what, this is who Thomas Nagel is, and yet he writes you know, a book that is called Mind and Cosmos, Why the Materialist Neo-Darwinian Conception of Nature is Almost Certainly False. Right. Right. Okay. Because, because he's just looking at the mind-body problem, mm. right? And, and how do you get from a brain to a mind. And even, even you know, the, the Australian philosopher David Chalmers, he, he said, you know, to go from a brain to a mind is like going from water to wine. Mm. It's a, like, and, and as John Lennox said in, in his thing, you know, a, a, a kind of a brain scan can tell you the electrical activity of my brain, but not what I'm thinking. I can tell you what I'm thinking, but not the electrical, electrical activity of the brain. These things are, are two quite different things, mm. aren't they? You yeah, know, yeah. Your first person sense of the, the continuity of your experience of the world in all its wonder um, is, is like quite a different thing from the synapses that are firing. You know. So the mind-body problem is just massive and it's called the hard problem of consciousness for a reason. It's mm. just really, really hard. How do you go from water to wine? without the kind of God who turns water into wine. Yeah. Right? Well, what is the explanation then? What best explains all this? Well, Genesis 1. You know, you go back to Genesis 1 and, and you see humanity made in God's image intended for a relationship with God. And, and then you see how it's fulfilled in John chapter 1. You see how in the incarnation, Christ the Word, who is one of the, you know, He is the law above, right? He is the law. It's not Judge Dredd. <laughs> it's like, Jesus. <laughs> He is the Logos, 
who like comes into the closest possible unity with us in this world. And then we have, you know, so the word became flesh, says John 1 verse 14, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only. So we are intended to share in the glory of this one who's come down. And so if we are intended to have a communion, have a relationship with the law of the universe, then our minds must be to some degree capable mm-hmm. of having that, that kind of communion. Um, but it's interesting, you know, John's gospel begins um, word and then cosmos, and then flesh, right? Begins with mind, and then world, and then humanity. Um, And actually, with that framework, consciousness makes sense. Um, Because what I often say to a a materialist, if I'm having a conversation with a materialist, if they make an argument for materialism, what are they going to use in order to make that argument, Mm -hmm. right? There'll, There'll be one conscious mind, having a conversation with another conscious mind, using reason and rhetoric and emotion and appealing to laws of logic. And what do you notice about all these things? Like that? Completely immaterial. Completely immaterial. So I often say, look, look, if you're a materialist arguing for materialism, even if you win the argument, you lose, <laughs> right? Because you're, 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 using, you're using this mind. You know, John Lennox has got a great quote where he says, um, you know, I. I don't want to buy into the materialistic worldview because I, I, can't, I can't buy into a worldview that undercuts the very rationality by which we're having this conversation. Yeah. But if we begin with mind and world and then we fit in there, that makes sense, especially because like right now, the most central experience I'm having is not even like the solidity of this table. The most central experience I'm having is my experience of the solidity of that mm. table, right? Yep. Yep. It's my mind experiencing the world out there. Mind comes first. Well, the Bible says mind comes first, yeah. right? It's mind over matter, right? <laughs> and, and I think the scriptures give us every reason for, for grounding that belief, the belief that's so intuitive that we never question it. We live on the basis of it. Um, but actually materialism doesn't, I'll, I'll just finish with this. Like materialism, the idea that um, matter in motion explains everything, leaves out all these different areas of our experience. It leaves out mind and it leaves out maths because is, is maths physical? You know, are numbers physical? It leaves out mind, it leaves out maths, it leaves out music and art and beauty and it, it leaves out mercy and miracles and all these other M's that you have meaning. It leaves out all these other M's just so that we boil all things down to matter in motion. And I just say, let's, let's have a much more rich, variegated understanding of reality. And then let's, let's investigate each of these aspects in a way that's appropriate to them. That's the way you do science. Mm. You know, you do science in a way that's appropriate to the object of inquiry. You don't do astronomy with a microscope and you don't do biology with a telescope. You adapt your method of inquiry to the object that you're inquiring. So if you're going to study minds, don't think just in terms of billiard balls clacking together. Don't think in terms of matter in motion. And if you're going to study maths, it's not the same as the materialist explanation. And if you're going to study mercy and meaning and music and all these other things, miracles, um, you'll be, you'll be using a different set of apparatus in order to understand these things. Mm. Otherwise you just end up being Betty in the laboratory thinking there can be no romantic meaning because I didn't see it under the microscope. Mm. But, you know, don't be a Betty. No, no one wants that. No. <laughs> Gareth shouldn't want that. <laughs> Move on, Gareth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah you, you can, can do better, Gareth. Do better. Right. <laughs> well, there's lots more food for thought there um, in this episode. And we'll be back with our next episode where we will be thinking about story, truth, and beauty. 